I am going to eat your soul and shit it out with me! I thought you only murdered boys. I go both ways. This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons over on Patreon. If you'd like early access to every video, ad-free content, and access to our Discord server, consider joining our community. Hello and welcome to Closeted History, the podcast where we out the queer and trans history that you never knew. My name is Destiny. I use she, they pronouns. And today's episode is all about Jennifer's Body, the cult classic uh, of 2009. I'm joined by my two comrades, Alex and Evan, and I'll let them introduce themselves. All right, cool. Uh, I'm Alex, also online known as All Things Labor on both Instagram and TikTok, where I discuss worker power and labor unions. Happy to be here. Happy to have you, Alex. (laughs) This is Evan. I am the host of Left of Projector podcast, a podcast about movies from a leftist perspective. And you can find me on that on all platforms, Left of the Projector pod. And yeah, I'm excited to be here as well. Yeah, it's so cool to finally have you on my podcast, Evan. (laughs) I know. I've been on yours a couple of times. But so uh, today's episode is about Jennifer's Body, um, came out in 2009. So the description on IMDb says, a newly possessed high school cheerleader turns into a succubus who specializes in killing her male classmates. Can her best friend put an end to the horror? (laughs) So many things wrong with that. Um, which I'm sure that we'll get into, but it was written by Diablo Cody, starring Megan Fox, Amanda Seyfried. Seyfried? Do you know how to say her last name, Alex? I thought it was uh, Seyfried. Honestly, it's been a minute since I've heard about the actress. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. okay, we think it's Amanda Seyfried. Seyfried? I'm sorry, Amanda, if you're listening to this, which she's not, <laughs> but and adam brody of course i've been re-watching the oc and so like seeing him in the movie i'm just like cohen get off the stage come on man <laughs> i guess we can start kind of at this really lovely description that we have for the movie what do, what do we think <laughs> i mean it's 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 funny it so when I when you I hadn't, hadn't read it before when you when it says the word succubus the only thing I can think of is like a really old episode of South Park where there's like a succubus and I don't remember any details about this episode at all but it just makes it seem or appear as if she is this you know cruel person doing these things and you know sucking their power away when it's it's couldn't be further from the truth I mean mostly not her own fault I don't know it's uh. It's very, uh, they don't even say the word succubus in the movie, do they? I don't think they do. Yeah, they mention it like one time at the end when she goes to the occult section of the library um, when she's like looking up the demonic stuff. Uh, So they do mention it one time. Uh, But so it it made its way into the description. Yeah, that's very, that reminded me of Twilight (laughs) when, when she's like, oh my God vampire the cold ones and she's like googling it or whatever right um but <laughs> i yeah i was just reading i had to look up what succubus man i was like what the hell is that and i was like ah okay um i mean and like sure you know for me the part that kind of stands out was just the high school cheerleader like i forget that jennifer was a cheerleader like what's the point of stating that because it's like maybe just right in the beginning where she's like doing this little thing and she's kind of having this like queer love with her best friend needy and they're like staring at each other but i'm like i completely forgot like she doesn't she never in the movie was like oh yes like your your perspective of what a cheerleader is supposed to be so i just think it's interesting that they use that to highlight it in the in the description for the entire movie i also had forgotten that she was a cheerleader when when you said that i'm like wait a minute is there a scene like that's like the opening scene just where they're because of course the popular girl at school has to be a cheerleader you know that's just you know the the way they would describe them in you know a lot of teen movies so it's they never mention it ever again in the movie at all that she's a cheerleader like they have football and other things but she's not present in any of these things for some reason no, well, and that scene actually has uh, your song in it, Evan, that you were talking about on the soundtrack. That's when that 
song plays. It is, yeah. And for anyone who doesn't know, it's the song I'm not going to teach your boyfriend how to dance with you. And I don't know if you want to talk about it now, but the the lyrics is specifically the thing that I was thinking of. I didn't know all the words to it, but I looked it up and it's very interesting as it comes to the plot of the movie. I feel like it's a perfect, I don't know, theme song, I guess you could call it since it's the opening song. Mm -hmm. Did you want to elaborate a little bit more like the lyrics or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, so the, so the, as the, (laughs) the first, the first line of it is, you are that you are the girl that I've been dreaming of ever since I was a little girl. And the thing that they immediately explain is that Needy and Jennifer are friends from, you know, like they were friends as little kids in a sandbox and they've ever been, you know, they're inseparable ever since. And then there's some additional um, things. He says one bite or the, the chorus is one, I'm biting my tongue Two, he's kissing on you three. Why can't you see one, two, three, four. And it's very, it seems very clear to me that it's describing without even making the song for the movie. It's that Needy has a boyfriend and Jennifer and her kind of have this undescribed maybe feelings for each other. And it's, uh, you know, very much the lyrics of, you know, them wishing they could be together. Yeah, I could see that for sure. And it does kind of summarize the the plot a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect song to choose, so kudos but that's all i had on the song i mean the rest of the soundtrack is also pretty good but that was the one particular note yeah i guess we can kind of start with like the soundtrack and kind of how it was marketed um because you know i know that evan you and nathan have had conversations about um soundtracks and their relation with like films and especially the twilight soundtrack i think that that was very emblematic of that time because this movie came out in 2009 so you know around the same time uh indie bands were kind of like getting their break through movie soundtracks and so like on this one silver sun pickups is on it uh florence and the machine um dashboard confessional dashboard confessional and then uh, paramore also and so like there were a lot of female centered bands um on the soundtrack and i think that that was on purpose for sure i think there's also a song by hole too which you know awesome (laughs) and i mean it's that's very gay (laughs) we love hole we love hole um but yeah i mean the whole soundtrack is like a 2000s pop punk nostalgia just like gold mine um i still definitely listen to the soundtrack today <laughs> i was just looking it up it said that it actually reached number three on the u.s soundtrack album but it was on the billboard top 200 even so clearly they had an idea of what they were doing with the soundtrack but as you said it was like marketed to like 20 year old men to basically just see a movie where megan fox was wearing you know short clothing that was like the that was the goal for them. Well, and I actually like I watched the trailer after watching the movie and like the the message, the plot, everything that is in the trailer doesn't really summarize what's actually in the movie. So I'd I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts about um, you know, the marketing and kind of how um that played out. I'm trying to remember so it came out in two thousand nine, right? That was the year to age myself. That's the year I graduated high school. I'm like 17 at the time, 16. Um, And I mean, Megan Fox was like it, you know, I mean, she she was like super hot. Like if you were like, not only see what, like if they're trying to appeal to like teenage boys, I mean, teenage girls were into her, right? Like even if you like don't identify as queer, you would look at Megan Fox and you're like, hmm, you know, like you were questioning. And (laughs) definitely was like the case for me because she's beautiful. But um I'm trying to think if I remember, I just, I feel like it, it just, it was perceived as bad, you know, like, I don't even think I saw it. I think you were, you had mentioned this at another time, Destiny, but just like, I did it. um, I didn't see it when it came out, which is like very much with how it became kind of like a cult classic as well. Or, and you know, just looking at the Rotten Tomatoes, it's like 40% or something like that's like really low uh but yeah i think trying to think back on when when i first watched it yeah i don't know i don't know what you guys thought in terms of like the marketing but i mean it was i think anything that had megan fox in it was trying to sell megan fox i don't think amanda very much was like that big of an actress at the time or at least i don't remember it like that 
Um, but I'm curious on what you all think. Well, what's crazy is I actually, I didn't remember this because I didn't see any of the Transformer movies, but she was also in a Transformers movie the same year as this came out. So she had two movies that year, this, which was like a total flop. And then the Transformers made $836 million. So just like oh, wow. 800 million more. Do- I mean, granted, those were, you know, those were big movies. It was the same year as Avatar. I mean, I don't have any memory of the trailer or this movie coming out, honestly, in 2009. The I probably saw it a good five years later at some point when I was just watching more horror movies and someone's like, oh, have you you know heard of this movie? It has Megan Fox in it. And again, that's how they people would talk about it if they weren't like, you know, into horror or they just wanted you to see the movie. Oh, Megan Fox is in it. That's kind of the, the selling point for it. And I think it's a, it's a shame because I think it could have done well. Although at that time, I don't, it wasn't really the best time for horror movies either. I don't really remember a ton of good stuff coming out in that period. So maybe it just was a bad marketing, bad time. Just, they, they just screwed it with this movie, but that's why we can watch it now and like it. Yeah. I think that it was a different time (laughs) for feminist uh, and for feminism just in general. Uh, So like this movie already kind of has like a lot of male gaze elements to it, uh, which, you know, unfortunately is part of Hollywood and especially when women write movies that, um, cause Diablo Cody is a woman. Um, unfortunately, I mean, she faced a lot of misogyny in the making and a lot of the, the misogyny was directed like at Megan Fox, which is why she was part of like, you know, the, the marketing kind of ploy. Uh, and she was in Transformers, which was marketed to teenage boys. And so they kind of went with the the same thing. But I did see that uh, it kind of gained its like status as a cult classic in the 10 year anniversary because of like, it was kind of in the wake of like the Me Too movement. Um, and so I think that, you know, People looked at the, they were able to look at the movie with a different lens uh, later on. But unfortunately, you know, part of the marketing was just exploiting Jennifer's body, <laughs> which is, you know, one of the the themes. And so it it's kind of haunting a little bit the way that that worked out. I just noticed, I don't know if you know what the, like the, like, like the Raz Awards are. Do you both know what they are? Like the, it's basically these for like the worst acting they're called like the golden <laughs> yeah. raspberry Awards, so they call them the razzies jennifer yeah. or jennifer uh megan fox got a nominee nomination for both jennifer's body and a transformers movie as worst actress in 2010 when they did the awards which i think is i haven't seen the transformers movie i don't know what it was like but it's i think that that's uh that's pretty harsh ouch I mean, some of the lines were kind of cheesy, but like it's not also her fault. they were they were kind of funny too. Like like when she <laughs> she gets the the box cutter, uh, and she's like, "Do you get all of your murder weapons from Home Depot?" God, you're so butch. <laughs> <laughs> so like you know, little quips like that that became like you know very iconic lines. I think. Some of them were a little bit cheesy, uh, but you know, again, yeah. it's it's like, what do you do with the the conditions that you're given? Um, you know, people weren't cheering for this movie to happen, so I think that that definitely influenced the way that it was produced. Yeah, yeah and I feel like uh, from the movies that I have seen her in, she kind of tends to like they they tend to give her roles that are like the same. It's the same role, right? So she's acting like the same person. So. So yes, I think in retrospect, watching it now, I'm like, oh my God, that is very cringy or hilarious. Like, like I'm laughing at it now. So I enjoy it in comparison to being like, wow, that was so deep. You know what I mean? So I'm not sure if that was what the director was trying to do. Um, but, but I mean, I don't know. I think a lot of, not to like make an excuse, but I think a lot of actors are actually not, you know, don't do that great. Um, especially like female roles, right? When like the ones that Megan Fox is like kind of, only given yeah her movies like she was um she did all the transformer movies and she was in like some of the teenage Mutant ninja turtle like the reboot and and uh yeah it's i mean that's just what they're they're casting her for a certain 
role. And so they're saying, okay, well, you're the attractive person in this movie. You know, you can't sound smart. You have to sound like a dumb ditz or something because that's just what she has to play. And so it's unfortunate because, you know, with an even better script, I mean, it could have, I don't know, it would have been even better. Although I, I have to say some of the lines are, as you said, like really cheesy, but you know, I'll give it a, a kind of a pass for 2009. Yeah. My, my introduction to Megan Fox was confessions of a teenage drama queen with mm. Lindsay Lohan and like the Disney movie. So Megan Fox has always been like the mean girl that I always sort of had a crush on. So like, you know, Jennifer's body was, like the perfect role for her <laughs> in in my little teenage heart you know but so um yeah maybe that's a good transition to kind of talk about like the theme um and dynamic between Megan or well the character Jennifer and Needy that I think that it really spoke to a lot of the experiences of like teenage girlhood um they're very mean to each other and like in ways that they know would be hurtful. <laughs> um, and in some ways that are really like internalized misogyny. Um, for example, like at the end when uh, Jennifer is eating Needy's boyfriend, Chip, um, and they, you know, kind of have their little tussle with each other. And Chip stabs Jennifer with that pole um, and then Jennifer asked, like, oh, do you have a tampon? I just figured I as I'd ask because it kind of seems like you're you're plugged, like, you know, that you're on your period. And that <laughs> sometimes becomes very weaponized, like men will like, oh, you must be on your period. You're in a bad mood. Like, and so, you know, just the way that they interact with each other. I'm interested to hear kind of what your thoughts were. It's funny that they have that line because earlier in the movie, Jennifer says PMS isn't real. It was invented by the boy run media to make us seem like we're crazy. So it's it's kind of a funny thing to say early on as kind of like a, you know, a not so off base thing that, you know, women are, oh, you're, she's this because of that. And so, you know, uh, just that's misogynistic. And then the other one is kind of the internal, as you said. So I don't know. It's, I don't know what to make of that, but. Maybe that's poor writing that there's the two sides, or maybe that's kind of her struggle is that she's, is, you know, I think at the end, uh, doesn't Needy say that she's, you know, that she has no self-confidence. No, that's not the exact thing she says, but like low self-esteem. And so, yeah, so she's, she you know, she's says, struggling. are you like really that insecure? Insecure. Yes. That's yeah. it. So, right. So it's, it's, I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, she has this insecurity because of how she's supposed to, act and look and be for all the the boys yeah i was thinking about that exact line as well evan of at the beginning where where she says that and that it's like i feel like at that moment that may have been perceived as much more like feminist i guess and now would be like no a pms is real like it, it is actually a thing you know um but it is also like two th two things could be true at the same time it is also a way for it to be dismissive of like of what people who menstruate, you know, who have certain, um, uh, who are impacted by it. Right. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, you know, I think, I think it's kind of, a, I think it's a little bit of both of what you're saying, Evan, cause it's like, well, one, clearly they have a lot of like really shitty writing in this, in this movie. Right. Uh, and there's like a lot of examples that we can, we can say, but I think this, that one at the end, like aligns more with that when I feel like the PMS one, I don't know, was was one of those moments that the film had that I think was slightly like more critical, but in a way that's like not in your face uh, because it is, you know, you are targeting teens. And uh, and I thought that was interesting, like look, looking at it now as an adult, like in retrospect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of, uh, as the, far as the writing goes, it's like pretty uneven and cheesy. And that I mean, it also doesn't take itself very seriously, which I guess you could also say is sometimes a good thing. And it's also nor I mean, I would say normal is the wrong word, like in the quotation marks, like normal for horror movies to have kind of this often have kind of that cheesy writing, but 
Yeah, they kind of have different competing messages with some of the like the main two female characters. Yeah, and unfortunately, like that just goes back to production of like what what level of feminism is palatable uh, to the mainstream that you know like Diablo Cody can only do so much as far as the writing is concerned, like because at the end of the day they do have to attempt to make money and like evan you brought up the the razzies earlier and that like i just think about ever since i did like the research for frida and harvey weinstein's influence on that that fucking terrible ass human like his influence on the movie and just how much he fucking owns Hollywood. I mean, even today, his influence is still felt through the people that he associated himself with. And so I just I think about that as kind of the example. And I just wonder how many other female writers experienced that level of misogyny within like their production. Um, Because Selma Hayek has been very open about, you know, the way that he treated her. Um, and, and he's just one example. He, he got caught. <laughs> People spoke out, you know? So I, I think about all of the, the misogyny that goes unchecked in, in Hollywood, especially. And unfortunately, I, I think that it really did come out in, in the way that the movie was produced. Yeah. There's a lot of things that I was looking at from the, the writer, uh, Diablo Cody on like kind of how how she was writing it and kind of her influences and things. And she had all these like really good ideas on how to bring it in. And it seems like some of them made their way through into the final product. But then, as you said, I don't know what other things were removed or cut or, you know, the studio says that you can't have this. So it'd be, I'd love to see like the, what the original script would have been. I bet it would have been a lot better movie. Yeah, and what's interesting is that, like, in the trailer, there are some scenes that are not in the movie. So, like, clearly there is some shift (laughs) in the messaging and in the narrative that's being sent. And I think, you know, part of that really shitty marketing is that they were really trying to exploit Megan Fox and and her image. Um, Because, you know, there were scenes that weren't, even part of the movie at all that's interesting i didn't i didn't realize that or that i mean i didn't i didn't watch the trail so i guess i didn't know that did he produce it weinstein uh, i don't yeah think so. oh but you know it's 2009 so i feel right. like at this time he's around right so yeah you know and like think about how many people he worked with and his behavior and then you know people get bold (laughs) when they're around other people that that are allowed to do that um by it being like unchecked or you know just not like dealt with and and i think that the movie kind of touches on that also like the the really lack of consequences for male actions in the movie you know jennifer's whole transformation is thanks to a group of dudes who decide to sacrifice her to the devil which it's actually based on like a real life story in 1995 uh elise Powler was strangled killed and then sacrificed to the devil so there was definitely some (laughs) real life influence um in in the film yeah um, I think I did read that on your in your notes, but uh, do you happen to know like if did they give a reasoning for why they um for for the murder? Oh, like the real life people? Yeah. Um, the thread that I read on Reddit just said by making this perfect sacrifice to the devil, they would gain more craziness or nuts that would make them play harder, play faster, and by making the sacrifice to the devil it would make them go, quote, professional. So, so so it is similar to what Jennifer, like Jennifer's body, like. Yeah, so it was a death metal band that sacrificed her. But, you know, in the, the movie, it's an indie band. Yeah, that's funny. One thing I, I also, I, I couldn't find this online. I think you have to buy the DVD, but there is a director's cut with apparently, like, I bet all those scenes in the, trailer that they ended up cutting 
but apparently it's another 20 minutes long, the movie. And so I wonder, I'm curious now, you know, does that flesh out some of the things that we don't, you don't get as, as much maybe as the relationship you get some between Edie and Jennifer in the movie, but it would be interesting to see, is it just more violence? You know, what did they cut? And I'm assuming it's because the studio said like, you can't have this in it or it's too long or, you know, men won't like this if you're, you know, mean to them, presumably, or something. I don't know, whatever they would say. But yeah, well, like even in the film, the patriarchy is still also harming men. Like the the kid Chip, uh, Needy's boyfriend, his mom gives him like a little pepper spray. It's like ladies pepper spray. And he's like, oh, don't worry. Like I can defend myself. I've been using the Bowflex. So like. <laughs> You know, we see the the way that the expectations of the patriarchy also harm men um, in addition to also, you know, the harm that is being caused to women. The way they treat the the male characters just generally is very, you know, the the football player that she ends up killing. I think it's the it's the first one you see her kill, but I think you learn that it's actually the second. I don't. I think so. I think she had killed the other, like the exchange student, maybe first. Yeah, in the con- in, right. In con- in, like she tells the story later, mm-hmm. but there's all these different characters that are, you know, kind of personifying the, you know, the ju- the jock, and then you know the. I'm trying to think of the other, like the kind of like the emo boy, I guess that she then you know has a crush on Jennifer, and then she lures him in and kills him too. It's all these very, lots of just stereotypes of different people you know, that you might see in a, in a movie, like in a, you know, a teen movie. So it's uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but I just noticed the, the, some of the lines Chip has too, are also very, some of the cheesiest in the movie too. Yeah. How would you describe him? Like what stereotype do you think that he aligns with? Well, I guess part of it is the, you know, kind of like the, uh, the, the boy in school, I guess, cause I think she makes a comment that he must be in a band. Is he a drummer? Is that kind of like a joke she says to him later? Yeah, I think he's in band. Yeah, so like a band, like a band kid who, you know, maybe his first girlfriend is needy and, you know, just kind of the seems like he's spending all his time, you know, just to try and sleep with her. And, you know, he does care for her. It does, you know, it seems like that, but he, you know, yeah, I guess like just the nerdy band kid. Yeah, I'm curious on your guys' thoughts on like what the direction was and how the how the movie wanted the audience to feel. Like did we feel any uh sympathy or empathy for Jennifer for Needy for the men, you know? Because I feel like for some men I did more than others. Like I don't know why, maybe this is just my own <laughs> like biases, but like for the football players, I was like I kind of really don't care. <laughs> yeah, same. <You> know? <laughs> Rest in peace, not really, um, in comparison to, like, the emo kid, right, who, like, you can tell, like, I don't know, like, I felt I felt for him. I mean, I definitely also felt for Jennifer, and I think it was because of what she had gone through, right? Um, but I'm curious on what you guys, like, how, how did you feel, and did you think that was, like, on purpose? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I also, with the football player, it's like, who cares, as you yeah. said, you know, whatever. He probably did some terrible things too, who knows. But yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, it's almost like you're born more feeling sympathetic for the people that she's hurting. You also feel bad for the, you know, the fourth exchange student who had like survived this fire at the bar. He's just trying to get home and, you know, she mauls him or eats him, whatever, on the way home to, you know, survive. And then you have the emo kid and then, I guess the next person is, uh, you know, Chip. So you you slowly feel more and more. I mean, maybe you're meant to slowly feel more and more, you know, anger or, um, you know, less sympathy for Jennifer, where at the beginning you just, you feel because she's just kind of doing it because she has to. And then it's almost like she's doing it because she can, right or wrong. Mm, that's, uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I th- I think that I definitely felt bad for the emo kid. Um, Cause and she says like I need you suffering whenever she kills him, and that like I I just really appreciated the way that the the movie like kind of subverted that because we we see so much violence towards women um, at the hands of men, and you know 
that women sometimes find themselves in these situations where they're they're very trusting of a man you know you're going on a date blah 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 just in the same way that uh jennifer is kind of luring in these men um it's often done to women you know uh and so i think that like when we see jennifer do it that like you said, Evan, we we kind of lose our sympathy and our empathy with Jennifer because we're watching her do these bad things. Um, but I think that it also kind of speaks to the way that we we see that happening to women um, very frequently. And I I just I like the way that the movie kind of subverted that a little bit. Yeah, I feel like the the one group of people I had absolutely no sympathy for was like the, the character of Adam Brody. Um, and, like, and I had like a big crush on him. Like I also grew up on the OC, right. He was like, he was a cutie. Like he was, so them depicting him as like, like a devil worshiper, basically, you know, it's like, uh, I thought, I thought, I thought that was great. Cause I'm just like, yeah, you can't trust, you can't trust these assholes. <laughs> None of them, no, no matter how nice they look. Um, but I think for the entire time like you know uh that i and i think needy said it right they're like oh like they're doing look at these amazing things that they're doing for uh devil's no it's not lake that's what he called it uh whatever the town is called kettle thank you Devil's kettle and and you know she gets into it with one of her classmates and she's like they're doing great it's like what is three percent and you know because they're only giving three percent of their proceeds and and um and they did this right they they murdered jennifer or or attempted to kill her, sacrifice her for fame, right? Which is um like you said, going back to the 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 true story that this might have been based on. Um and I think we could like go into what that means now, especially with like like, you know, being an influencer or even I didn't watch that um episode, but I know Black Mirror I believe they actually did it when there was a writer strike, which was happening. That's why I think I also didn't watch it. But um, Kim Kardashian was part of it, and it was like, "What are you? What? What are you willing to give up for fame?" Right? And I think it's um, kind of playing playing with what uh, what was happening in this in this movie. What are you? You are willing to take a life to have a hit song. Well, and that's the violence of capitalism, baby. And what's so funny about it is that Adam Brody's character thinks that they're now famous because they sacrificed Jennifer when it's only because the fire just, it's just literally just random circumstances, right? Like the fire happens, it becomes national news, a bunch of people die. So their song becomes this like national news anthem it has nothing to do with what they actually did. So they, they committed all this violence and simply as capitalism, we all know it's, you know, it's, mostly just luck for them. They lucked into this hit song because the shitty bar had a fire, which I also have a curious, I also have a question about the the fire, but maybe it's i uh, I'll save it. Well, I, I wanted to say really quickly that it kind of reminded me of like when all of the celebrities in 2020 during the lockdown portion of COVID that they all got on zoom and they're singing that stupid fucking song, like imagine or whatever, like in the way that capitalism often co-ops tragedy, uh, that it, it very much reminded me of like when that happened in 2020 and like literally people are suffering because you just won't wear a mask. And like, you know, that, people died in the fire, like, you know, and now this ban has become a a huge sensation. And so I I just, it's interesting to see, you know, we're talking about capitalism and in the way that it, it just, it definitely co-opted that, that tragedy. I'd I'd love to hear y'all's, y'all's thoughts on that. I mean, the shock doctrine, right, by Naomi Klein is the first thing that that I thought about right now that you're, from what you said, Destiny, which is like, it's, it's that that's what capitalism does, right? Capitalists extract from a position where people were mostly working people, poor people are um, already suffering tremendously. And maybe this is the question that Evan was going to ask, but I also was wondering this was, was that intentional? Be, like, was the fire intentional? Did they, did they, did, did the band do that or it just happened to occur? I think it was an accident because I want to say, and I, 
I could be wrong, but I want to say that it started because of like shitty wires at the bar or something. That was my question too. Like, did they intentionally like rig their wires in a shitty way? But then I also think it's a very small town. Clearly this bar isn't equipped for, you know, this thing. So the logical thing is that it's just like a shitty bar that overloaded its circuit, but you then look at them and think like they would do anything. They would like kill every because they get out very easily, right? They they're all fine. So I don't know, but yeah, the the other thing about the I, one of my that speech where she says like they're only giving you know three percent, and you know I'm, I'm like sitting there thinking like that's the you know this is a scene that they probably didn't even think of was this kind of uh, you know critique of capitalism. It, it was more just. Why are they doing this? And I also have to say, as a side note, it, that it's amazing that um, the teacher is J.K. Simmons with like the hook hand or whatever. I think he people probably know him from he's been in lots of uh, lots of movies, but I just love him in that one little bit. And it's funny how he's just I don't know. Yeah, I actually like I was wondering about that, that like that seems pretty ableist, right? That like, if he True. doesn't actually have a disability and he's kind of cosplaying like a disabled person a little bit, I would understand if it were like integral to the, the character's character, but like, it didn't really seem super relevant. So it like, I, I love, jk simmons don't get me wrong i, I love <laughs> yeah, it no it's fair but when when i saw that i was like "Ooh, <laughs> uh let's not do that buddy but it's you know unfortunately when you watch movies from like 2015 or earlier like it's it's pretty common that you're gonna hear the r slur the f slur and some pretty ableist racist uh anti-feminist kind of things in in a lot of mainstream movies um so i i do love jk simmons but we don't love that <laughs> yeah that's perfectly fair just hit like in like the in like his little wig because he's bald and the whole thing i just yeah i, but just I, do, throw it th I do think that um chip i think that's his son oh like jk simmons son because his name's like something simmons and i was like oh. mm, i wonder you're right yeah nepotism <laughs> those nepo babies <laughs> in Even hollywood in 2009. No. oh really quickly lol at chris pratt being <laughs> an almost cop in the movie <laughs> i i forgot that he was in it until like i heard his very iconic voice and i was like oh buddy <laughs> i forgot does he die in this. Uh, yeah yeah he does good he does <laughs> good <laughs> I didn't want to say, but I was thinking it, Evan. So yeah, the the worst <laughs> the worst Chris in Hollywood. So Adam Brody, we did mention it a little bit, you know, that he's he was my crush on the OC. I loved Cohen, and you know, I feel like during that time he did very much make it cool to be indie. Like it was cool to listen to Death Cab for Cutie, and uh, honestly, the OC showed me a lot of really cool indie bands um for the times but uh it's ironic that when they're actually like sacrificing jennifer he's like do you know how hard it is to make it as an indie band so like it's so funny that he is the one saying that when he kind of like brought being indie to the mainstream um and now you know he's struggling to make it in his his indie band in 2009 people have grown out of it i guess <laughs> Well, they referenced MySpace too, which I thought was funny. Yeah. Oh yeah, like oh, I checked out their MySpace page, and <laughs> the singer is extra salty. I was actually born in in, in the OC, uh, ooh, Orange County. Um, so I feel like, and growing up in Southern California, when that like when he was like huge, also the OC. Um, I never saw what was it one One Tree Hill, but at, like um, Laguna Hills or the one with. Um, what are they called? Laguna Beach is the yeah. one that ended up getting like the reality show, like kind of that entire era. I, I think it's just so fascinating thinking about 
what it means to kind of be seeking uh, fame or power or money through kind of the beginning of this this like influencer type right with which I think includes my space right like I remember Mm -hmm. being on my space and that being kind of like a thing like how many followers do you have right how what is what is your page your (laughs) look like how aesthetically pleasing or like what like is it indie what is the song that you have um and I think really your layout (laughs) yes like we all knew a little bit of code right because we were changing our pages every like I didn't realize like oh actually that is code yeah, exactly. Yeah, but so you were saying about like MySpace that you feel like it's like very kind of indicative of like an early influencer kind of stage. Yeah, yeah. So kind of just going back to what it means to kind of be online, right? To kind of use these social media platforms in a way to uh, obtain some kind of fame, but ultimately like even if you're trying to become this indie band or trying to become an influencer of whatever, the thing that you want is money, right? Because you want what money can provide to you on, under, you know, any kind of system, but especially a capitalist system, which is the stability because capitalism is so unstable. So this perception of like, let me get a little more piece of that pie, then I will be okay. Right. Which I, going back to what, what you said, Evan, when Needy said, like, oh, you're only getting 3%, right? They're only giving 3%. Like, and what, and I think she literally said, what is, what about the other 97, right? And I thought that was very powerful. And it's something that I think a lot about when we, when we think about like philanthropy, when we think about charities, right? Which is something that also ties in to capitalism and, you know, not to go into the rabbit hole of like what Reagan did and fuck Reagan, like in the eighties, but it was very much, privatizing and creating a lot of or making a lot of these government social service programs into 501c3s because why it supports capitalists it it supports people that already have the money and they continue to have the money now you're going to force the people that actually need support to beg these people that are already in positions of power to get money so I, I i thought it was really like i think it's fascinating we think about that or anyone who would like wants to become like a full-time influencer what you want is stability because you want to be able to have a home absolutely and you, and you want a life of dignity and respect that's what it is and people are willing to sacrifice a virgin to do so what did we think about like uh jennifer's parents or needy's parents because like needy's mom works overnight so i got the impression maybe she's like a nurse or something of the sort. Yeah, I just remember her saying she's like she was on the swing shift, and then you know she comes home. They're talking in the morning. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, everyone in the, I mean, just looking at the town in general. I mean, with the exception of probably a, you know some people, the majority of the town is probably very working class. You know, it's not a it's not a wealthy town. You know, like they're also they joke at the beginning how scientists are there like dropping balls into their you know the falls because they can't figure it out it's like you know the town is almost kind of like a joke to most people probably and it's it's clearly people are not doing great there you know that's they want to get out of there presumably yeah and i think that sometimes that's like where some of the worst like tragedies happen is like you know in small town america jennifer's body is supposed to take place in minnesota um so you know you just I imagine there are a lot of towns that probably have good, hardworking class people that are just struggling to get by. I I think the one part that I remember about Needy's mom is like saying that she was having like night terrors or something, right? And then she's like, oh, it's they're not night terrors because it's during the day because she works at night. To be honest, I feel like they seem very absent. Like they didn't seem to really be around or like in support. Um I don't even, do we ever meet Jennifer's parents? I don't think we did, right? The only time that I remember Jennifer's mom being present is there at the end, like when she catches Needy killing her. Um, But I don't, I don't remember seeing her at any other point in the movie, which is strange because we see um, Chip's mom a couple of times. And then we also see Needy's mom. So I think, you know, maybe that also kind of plays into to Jennifer's character that like, you know, um, depending on the involvement of her parents, like, 
you know, she's getting into trouble. Uh, so, you, you know, I, I think that that kind of shows that dynamic a little bit. Do you remember seeing her mom any other time? No. Yeah. I yeah, I didn't so. either. Is it okay if we talk about gay stuff now? <laughs> you know, I, I just want to talk about the, like, the queer coding and queer baiting it's been accused of. Uh, I think it's kind of hard to look at media with 2024 eyes and kind of accuse it of queer baiting because understanding the material conditions uh, that people are in definitely influences what can be produced. And, you know, we've talked about here about the production and 2009 was very, very different. Um, Queer was still a slur. (laughs) So, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it's just a little bit different. I do think that it, it spoke to, to, you know, queer girl friendship, like, you know, making out with your friend, even though they have a boyfriend, but you know, you can't talk about it. And like, you know, just that dynamic, I think that it, it kind of presented it pretty spot on. <laughs> so what, what were y'all's thoughts about like the, the queer coding or queer baiting? Yeah, I think watching it now as an adult, it, I was like, damn, like it does happen like this. Like, so for example, you know, when when she when Jennifer like was not interested in the emo kid at all and then Needy starts saying that she actually like likes him or like maybe not even like that, but she thinks he's cool or something. And she immediately turns around and then like ask him out and be like, yes, I'm down. And I think that talks a lot about kind of grow and grow relationships and grow and grow respect for each other like we're doing things like I mean I am putting on an outfit to get other women and girls to give me a compliment because that sends me to the moon in comparison to when a fucking man does it right and I think it's that especially true when it's like when we were when we were young right we want yes like there's a thing about being a you know a, a teenager and you want to be accepted but you want to be really accepted by your girlfriends and like you, the ones that you look up to and definitely there it was mutual between Jennifer and Edie right like uh or at least that's how I saw it um and then at the part when they did like make out right after after Needy had just had sex for the first time and I was like huh interesting you know um like what is what does that mean I think it's also like you know you're questioning you're in that time you're like I'm not really sure you know and I think uh I think for that moment, so one, yes, definitely for the male gaze, because it's like you're having two, you know, beautiful women make out, et cetera. But I think it also spoke to girls, right, who are like, am I gay, you know, <laughs> or like, <laughs> wow, why do I like this? Or, you know, whatever it may be. And I, and I think like two things could be exist at the same time. And I think it's one of those moments because, um, I mean, that's, that's what I saw. I'm like, yeah, you know, you play, you play around with, with your girlfriends when you were a kid and like, damn, that was actually kind of gay. <laughs> like what we were doing, it's pretty queer. <laughs> well, and one of the things too, that, that I think is played up very heavily and especially in the first, I don't know, 15 minutes, I mentioned it earlier is, you know, why, you know, someone's like, why are they, why you, why does Jennifer like you? This kind of nerdy kid. And, you know, they were the sandbox love never dies is like the line that they use, but it's very clear that they don't seem to have things in common in kind of all the things they're talking about, you know, Jennifer's talking about all the people she slept with and needy is like, is a, is actually a virgin, you know, until later in the movie and all these different things. And there, there's all these, um, you're, you're still trying to figure out like, why is it that they're, that they're still friends? And is it, you know, one of them, you know, clearly her nickname is needy because she literally needs her friend, Jennifer, you know, it's a very, very uh, uh, on the nose kind of nickname that she goes by. And then the other line that I thought was interesting, the kind of, I'm curious what you both think of the line. I think it's when they're, when she's describing this, how she had been sacrificed, you know, by uh, Adam Brody, she says, I just know that I woke up and I found my way back to you. Like very clearly, like I'm, you know, I belong with you. And then I think that's also when they end up making out right after that, I think. And so mm-hmm. it's clearly Jennifer is confused, you know? I mean, I think she may be realizing why she's still with, you know, with Needy. And, you know, it also probably makes her feel better because, you know, later, as you know, she is insecure. And so all of these things point to, you know, something, feelings that are uh, not 
able to be expressed mostly from Jennifer's side, it seems. Yeah, because Jennifer's definitely like the the popular hot girl that Needy is in love with, but that Jennifer definitely has some feelings that she doesn't want to admit to herself too. Um, and that like they're even described as lesbian gay, <laughs> like their friendship um, is that homoerotic that you know even other people describe it that way. Um, and you know it's it's kind of sad because like I w- I would describe it as a queer relationship uh, the way that they interact with each other, but you know they maintain that relationship despite the very clear red flags because like needy is codependent (laughs) with jennifer and vice versa based on you know the line that you just said evan um so you know i i think to to get to see them kind of navigate that space it felt like it it spoke to a real experience and uh i think that it seemed like there were real queer people writing you know at least that dynamic of of the movie because it felt like it it held pretty true yeah I feel like I completely agree Destiny I feel like one thing it just felt very real when like right now Evan when you said oh they had like nothing in common a lot of my friends in high school in retrospect I had nothing in common with and and somehow they were like some of my best friends right uh one of them is actually a neighbor uh still my parents like neighbor and I, I have nothing in common with this girl but we were like inseparable you know in high school and uh, and I think that, that that's why it feels very just genuine in that sense. Uh, so on top of the fact that like, yeah, you know, you're hanging out with your girlfriends and it might get a little <laughs> homoerotic <laughs> every once in a while, you know, and, and, and I think that codependency. So like, you, which, you know, queer or not, like I think a lot of times when you're a teen, you're definitely having that. Um, with with some of the the people that you're closest to and I definitely felt that with both uh, Jennifer and Needy. I did want to like quickly touch on um, that I just put it in my notes here that like many times in the movie there's like real suffering happening but it's interpreted in a different way so like Needy voices concern about Jennifer and Chip just thinks it's like the trauma from the fire Uh, So he's like, he's very dismissive of her. Then like the football guy, he's screaming, but the teacher thinks that it's just like related to him, like being upset about the fire trauma. Um, And then again, like Needy is hallucinating and Chip thinks that she's like orgasming. So I I think that that like subversion of like real suffering that's interpreted in a different way or that's like then dismissed um, I'd love to to hear y'all's thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that part, Destiny, uh, when they were, that's when they were having sex for the first time, right? And then like, and his immediate, which I think has to do with like the patriarchy and like male ego, right? Like his immediate response was like, am I too big for you? you oh know? my God, just... I know. Like Chip, fucking be quiet. <laughs> Absolutely not, Chip. I'll tell you that right now. I don't have to see it to know that's not true. <laughs> like I need you to fucking relax. <laughs> <laughs> but um and and I don't even think like they even talked about it right like like it, it I mean at least it wasn't portrayed in the film where it's like hey actually this occurred his response to it was something it's still, it was still it might have been something else or something you know that the sex was so great or whatever his penis is too huge or whatever um but yeah I think that I think those those moments where it was like actual suffering that like, only kind of like the 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 person that's dealing with it and the audience knows was a way to kind of make the characters more flawed. Right. So like, if you are feeling some kind of way about chip, which, you know, chip is like a likable, a livable character. You're like, Oh, that poor guy, you know? And like, you know, it's like going to come at some point uh, where he's going to die, but you're like, Oh, he, he, you know, he, he looks like like a good kid, right? He's like a teen. He's her boyfriend. He's kind of nice to her, etc. Um, but it's also like, yeah, but you're still under the patriarchy. You're still, you know, you're still human, and you still make mistakes. And I think this happened with all of them. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm curious what you both think about that. The scene, not just kind of Chip's reaction, but the kind of this emotional connection that they're clearly seeming to show between Jennifer and Needy, where she's 
she's supposed to be doing something where she would be, it'd be pleasurable for her, but instead she's living through Jennifer's killing of this emo kid. And seemingly for Jennifer, it's almost like a pleasurable experience because she now is, you know, fulfilled in some sense. So that's, that scene, like, I don't know what to make of it and like kind of the grand scheme, except that they're like, they're intrinsically connected in some way beyond just, and also I think later when she's describing, Jennifer describes to Needy, you know, what had happened, you know, she said that she had, you know, she went to see her when she was hungry, presumably, but doesn't kill her because she obviously has these feelings for her. So the reason why she's safe and she's able to even tell her about all these things, because there's lots of times they talk about, there's no secrets between friends is that they have this connection that's, you know, undying for, you know, what they're 17. So 15 years they've known each other, presumably. Well, not only because she like loves her, it may be in like slightly gay way and or a friendship way, but I think it's also because she's a girl and like, I mean, it's not, if I remember correctly, Jennifer didn't kill any woman, right? She was literally just killing boys, right? And I think she says that at one point. She was like, oh, they're just boys or whatever. And I think that just, for me, it was just like, oh, I don't know, made me feel safer as a, as a girl, like if this is going to occur, which I think is interesting because that's like usually not the reality of, of women. I mean, you know, for a lot of people, but for girls and women, it, you, like it's not a safe world. So for this movie to kind of be like a, an alternative reality where women are safer or girls are safer, something that I really appreciated um, that I thought was more of like a feminist perspective. And I'm saying we got to go out and kill men, obviously not, but like I'm saying like, it just felt like uh, a juxtaposition to what the real world is for, for girls. Yeah, for sure. She does uh, like at the pool scene, she's like, Oh, I thought you only kill girls. And then the iconic, like I go both ways uh line <laughs> so uh, like but i think that that does kind of speak to the experience of womanhood that there are some times where we we turn against each other we uh definitely have internalized misogyny that we have to unpack for ourselves um to see the way that the patriarchy is is influencing our relationship with other women um, but yeah, you're absolutely right that like, you know, it, it is kind of like this uh, sisterhood or, you know, this camaraderie amongst women that is is definitely present in the movie um, and, and does kind of subvert what is present within the real world. That's that's a really great point. And just visually wise, the scene with like in like the gross pool at the end is all is also really pretty cool. I don't know, just uh yeah, it seems like the perfect place for like a final kind of murder scene or kill scene in like a. And I love her pool. dress. Yeah. I well, I do, love the dress. <laughs> don't they also say? Doesn't she know to go there? Needy know to go there because that's a place they had hung out. Is that the implication? Presumably, they'd gone there like swim or. I couldn't remember why she knows to go to that place. Like when I was watching it, I, I couldn't remember if there was a, a reference earlier in the movie or something like that. That might've been cut. Yeah. I did notice like that it multiple like times in the, the movie, Jennifer has one of her fingernails painted a different color, which is actually like a, a queer coded signal from like back in the day that that's how you would signal to other women that you were queer. Um, so I, I thought that that was kind of like a cool, I guess not Easter egg, but you know, like a, a cool little nod to, to the history. What would you give it out of 10? Hmm. I'd give it eight, seven and a half. Yeah. I think I would give it a seven. Uh, it's like, you know, it's a classic and it's like, it reminds me of, a simpler time <laughs> I don't, and uh yeah i like it's for me it's the right amount of like not actually scary or gory but but like not you know like i i don't i don't like i don't think i don't like things that are too intense life is too intense i can't watch films that are too intense so <laughs> that makes so this perfect was, sense you know so like so the, the cheesiness of this was perfect like that in contrast with the murders perfect yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, as far as like when I th when I was thinking before, I was saying like at night, like this period of time wasn't great for horror movies. You know, I mean, 
it's still I would still consider this a horror movie, you know, in in some ways. You could maybe argue and there are they can only think of a couple other movies even from that year that were were good. So yeah, I gave it four out of five on Letterbox, so that's about an eight. I mean, yeah, it's you know, right about there I'd say is is fair. I think it's definitely worth watching just if you like movies and then I think if you Yeah. I would recommend it to anyone. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to have to agree. I would probably give it like a, a 7 out of 10. Um, I mean, I I think that in a lot of ways it, it kind of aged pretty poorly. <laughs> but uh, I don't know many movies from the late 10s that didn't. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a cult classic. The, I think the costume design is really great. And um, we love gay girls. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's definitely a good movie. And if you haven't seen it, I think that you should definitely watch it. I'm actually I'm coming up on an interview with the editor of It Came From The Closet, which actually features Jennifer's body. So if either of you haven't read that book, it's really great. It's like a collection of essays from like... Mm you know, queer perspectives. Um, It's got quite a few different authors in it. All right, so thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today. I really enjoyed our talk on Jennifer's body. Um, Do you want to tell the good folks where they can find you? Sure. You can, again, listen to Left with Projector, especially episodes with Destiny, if you want to hear more of us discussing movies, including the latest one on the Twister, Twisters, and leftwithprojector.com. And thanks for having me. It's been great. Yeah, thank you, Destiny, for having me. It's nice to see you again, Evan. And uh, again, my name is Alex. You can uh, find me on social media, on TikTok and on Instagram as uh, all things labor. If you want to organize your workplace, hit me up. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you both. And uh, thank you so much for listening. And until the next time.